Okay, so welcome to day one of the Android HTML5 development class, part three. We've got this month to work with on the final topics of the class. If you look on the class catalog, it goes from today to, let's see, to November. Uh, I gotta double check if it's either if it's either December first or November 29th, sometime around there. So we've got a few weeks to do uh, more of this um, concept, and we're going to continue where we last left off, which was the database. We started to talk about PouchDB and how we can use that to store data. We had gotten to the point, I believe, where we've started to save the data and started to retrieve the data. We still need to then delete data and update data and then incorporate that into our project. So I've got a copy already on my flash drive of the project. You should already have it also. PouchDB start with the date. And uh, we're just doing this to focus on one topic. So that's all you really need at the moment. Uh, don't forget to use sign and shipper to do this. And uh, you can enroll in the class. So we, all we need uh, at the moment is the HTML. We've got jQuery there to make it easier for us to, uh, to type our JavaScript. And then the pouch file. We definitely need that in order for all of that to work. So make sure you've got those from the folder. And I'm going to edit the pouchdb HTML file in Notepad. Go ahead and open the HTML file in Notepad to remind ourselves what this looks like. You want to run this. I'm going to run it in Chrome just because I like the, uh, the developer's console a little better than Firefox's. But I'm going to run this in Chrome, open up developer console, and um, if you do a quick test, you might see something in the console, and then I'm going to put in some information here. I can make it up, so I'll say I'll put in 2059H, this is Android 3, Instructor Campos, I will save that. We get some output in the console, uh, we might comment some of this stuff out because it's going to get a little messier. But line 52 yields that I was able to save. I mean, uh, line 52 was, what is the object? Line uh, 56 is that it was successfully saved to the database. Oh, don't forget to enroll in the class. Because it's brand new class. And so then if I click Show Classes, which I misspelled, but Show Classes, then it's going to start to show a table of our classes. We're pulling data out of the database, and we're starting to display it on screen. Our console also has a little bit of output saying that we're pulling data from the database. It's one object so far, the zero width object. And there's my class. If I had another class, let's say it was class 2040, that was Android 2, Instructor Campos, Save, show, there's Android 2 class, I'm doing something else, 2099, this is um, social media, Instructor Jones, save that, show that, you get the idea, it's showing our output from the database, it's alphabetically based on the CRN, we've chosen that our CRNs um, will be what alphabetizes our content. Uh, that's the underscore ID element. So this is displaying in order, and we've got this pencil at the end of the screen. The pencil is for us to be able to uh, edit the data there, and um, we're going to get to that eventually. The easier thing at this point in our knowledge will be to delete something from the database. I want to make it uh, explicitly difficult for a person to delete a class. Um, we could set it up how we will do it later that we can edit a class with a simple button. 
but I want to make it a little bit harder for the user to delete the class because it's so important that they don't delete the class. If they delete it, it's gone. We haven't built in a system of undelete, which takes more effort and setup. So we're going to make it deliberately a little harder for the user to delete a class. The way we'll do this is, in addition to displaying a list of classes, then there will be new options here to delete a class. So below this table, we will build the delete mechanism. We'll get back oh, one more thing here while we're in the while we're in the browser. Remember, if you go over to your application tab of Firefox in, in I mean in Chrome, in Firefox it's hidden somewhere else. But if you go to the application tab, you will see that we are running index DB internally. And uh, our pouch database is under index db, and it shows we've got a we've got a pouch database in this file. And in my case, because I've already started to add data, I can see here by sequence, this is the data I've added so far. You can open these up to further see more information. We're saving the name of the class, the instructor of the class. There's a unique key, which is right there. And then there's a revision, which keeps track of the changes in your database per document. So we can't actually edit this data in the browser. It doesn't have that mechanism. But we're going to set it up ourselves so that we will be able to edit these classes with that pencil. Get back to our code. Scroll down to line 97 if you're using my file. What we want to do here is, in addition to showing our table, which is that this is, that's what is happening here, this for loop loops through our data to build row by row of table data, tabular data. In addition to that, I also want to display a mechanism to be able to delete classes. So we'll say here, line 100 is what actually is displaying that string of HTML as HTML in the element div show. Well, before displaying that string, let's add a little bit more to the string. I'm going to back up and make a new line 100. Let's say str plus equals quotes semicolon. We'll say uh, we'll create a, a, a basic horizontal ruler here. Uh, remember, we're dealing with plain old HTML and JavaScript at the moment, so we don't have jQuery Mobile at the moment in order to do more interesting visual effects. So we'll just rely on a basic horizontal ruler. Next line, we'll continue to add to the string. The way we'll set this up is there will be an input box that the user will type in the unique CRN number and then click delete. So we will need an input tag of type text. Now be careful here, I'm doing the single quotes because I've got the double quotes wrapping all the way around the whole string. I'll put a placeholder to let people know what I'm expecting them to type. Placeholder single quotes. This is going to assume a, uh, a CRN number. We'll say something like 2059H. This needs an ID so that we can reference it. Uh, we'll call this btn delete.
space yeah. there, and then what we will do is create, um, in this instance, just for something different, a button. We'll use the button tag, which has a pair. Let's say delete class. In order for us to access it via the JavaScript, it needs an ID. Oh, actually, this should not have been btn delete. That's not the button. That's, um, what do we call it? In. Just to be consistent with what are we call these other ones. Sorry about that. We call it field. Okay. We'll call it field delete. Sorry. Let's back up. Field delete. This is going to be our field where we will type what class we are deleting. What I meant was for the button, we, that's where we'll have the ID of btn delete. So make sure you fix that. The input field has ID of field delete, and then the ID is btn delete. I mean, and then the button is btn delete ID. It's not, it's not complete yet, of course, but go ahead and check it in, uh, in your browser just to make sure that you didn't uh, mistype anything in the code. If you click the button, nothing should really happen yet. We haven't gotten that far, but we are, we've built these elements. And what this looks like is, once you run it, and you have classes, you can show classes. And then you'll get the table of classes as before, and then a, a ruler, and then a box for the class. So this is the spot where the user will type in the name of the CRN. So of course we could set it up that with a simple click or a swipe of this data, we can delete it like a regular app. We're not there yet because we don't have the functionality, for example, of jQuery Mobile, which will let us do something more visually interesting like a real app. We will get the functionality of it at the moment, and then later on we can put the, the frosting on, on that cake. The concept is I'm going to type a, uh, a CRN, so every class is identified with a unique CRN. I'm going to type a CRN, and then click delete, and it will delete it from the database, from the app. It doesn't work yet, of course, but we're getting there. Here what we're doing is we're dynamically creating a, an input field and a button. And then we're going to use our JavaScript to make that button active. Okay, so if we look at... Back up on line 39 or so, we've got our event handlers. We've got the button say, we've got the button show um, and this one respectively saves a class, shows the classes. I want now an event handler to delete the class that the user typed in. So what we've done beforehand is we created variables based on the elements on screen and then gave them event handlers. The problem here is this works for elements that existed at runtime. When you save it and run it and it compiles it, the btn save element existed, the btn reset existed. As soon as you run this, these things exist, but the delete class doesn't exist until the person does show class. So we have to write those event handlers a little different to account for something that doesn't exist yet until a person clicks show class. So we, we won't create uh, an element beforehand that we can have ready to use. We can still We can still uh, make it work. 
Uh, we're going to have the um, JavaScript object selector. And if you recall, the way this is working is technically that button is being written into the body, specifically into this div, div show. This div show is completely empty, but dynamically we write data into it. So our trick is that we have to reference something that first exists. Div show exists at compile time, at runtime. So that's what that's what our selector will be with dot on, the same as before, on click. But then we have to specify now a little deeper. We're specifying an element that exists, and now an element that doesn't exist until we make it exist. So comma in quotes, pound, btn, delete, that delete button. We could not put that pound delete here because it doesn't exist at this point. Div show does. btn, will, btn delete will, will exist once the person does show classes. So targeting an element that exists to be clicked on, specifically then an element that exists dynamically, comma, what function we need to run from that click comma, the, th the third argument here will do fn delete class. Remember, no parentheses here because uh, that function would then immediately invoke if we put a parentheses in this instance. No parentheses. And then now we need to define a uh, function that explains what fn delete class is. Check if you've got your code here. Pound div show and then pound btn delete. We'll go back to the bottom again where we're defining all of our functions. So after the function of show table class, while I'm here, we didn't write any comments on that function. We'll get back to it. But before I forget, I'll at least say that that's my end of my f and show class classes table. So that the next line I can start to define this new function. just a, a quick uh, console output or alert or whatever just to make sure that this is working let's do console the failure point could be double this time because uh, we were writing that uh, event handler differently than ever before we're targeting an element that doesn't exist until later dynamically so there could be a failure there let's check if this works save it and run it click to show classes and then click that delete class button and in your console you should get you should get feedback So I'm going to refresh that, show class, click delete class, we get output, we delete it. doesn't work yet, of course, but uh, at the very least it is supposed to be reacting. It's not, call me, because something was mistyped. So, um, before I forget, let's back up to where we created that uh, event handler just to give ourselves a note. 
So this right here is different than we've seen before. So this event handler first target an element that exists, which is pound div show. Then the dynamic element, which is pound btn delete. So sometimes we need to do this depending on what we're trying to work with, uh, especially with dynamic elements. At runtime it didn't exist, so we had to first target the one that did exist and then the non-existent one. <clears throat> you see the syntax for that. We have a second argument there. We didn't need one over here because these elements exist. You can uh, then have a, a second argument there. Back to the function. Function delete. What we need to do is collect the, uh, the CRN that the user provided that we're trying to delete. So this will be a plain old as before, create a variable, dollar symbol, We'll call this uh, the class. That's the, the class in question to delete equal to the selector again. ETN, we called it, or uh, pound, we called it field, uh, field class, field uh, delete, ID field delete. The input field we created right there. Field delete. We don't need to get deep into this same sort of target an element that doesn't that does exist before targeting an element that doesn't exist in this case because this at the moment that we click seems to target the element because it exists at the moment we we click. And we're saying dot val. Give me the value of what the person typed into that box. Now there are there are various um, there's always a danger when we have user input that we have to deal with the user input properly or else things might not work. So here as we have it, this is a little bit too open-ended. What I mean by this is that if I were to run this and I'm gonna delete class 2040A, and I would click delete, true or false, I would delete my class. False, it would not delete the class. I'm trying to delete class 2040A, but I want to delete class 2040A. What's the difference? Uppercase, lowercase, that is case sensitive. So if a person is trying to delete class 2040A and they type in lowercase and they click delete, it will not work. And if we didn't program some sort of error message, the user will be confused and angry and give us one star on the App Store. So we need to fix this a little bit. Um, the simple thing to do here is if we're assuming and we want the person to type in a CRN which is defined like this, we want to then force the letter, whatever letter they typed, to be the letter that we're assuming it is. So we have the option to um, we have the option to send it to uppercase or to lowercase. Okay, so after we've uh, grabbed the class, then we'll do the class equal to the class dot to uppercase method. 
So we have the two uppercase method. This is plain old JavaScript. And what this does is it takes whatever string you have and it forces it to uppercase. So if a person types in a lowercase, uh, a lowercase a, it'll force it to uppercase if it was saved as uppercase. Well, knowing this, that might be something to also do when we get the input of the class. This would still cause a problem if the person originally saved the class 2005b, lowercase, and here we're, sh we're forcing it to uppercase to delete it. Well, the uppercase version doesn't exist. So we'll go back uh, in a moment and we'll see. We need to add that back to the input. We'll get back to that. But uh, here then, this will take whatever they typed and force it uppercase because it has to be the same uh, letter if we want to actually work with it. Next line, db.remove. I'm sorry, not remove, not yet. db.get first. In order for us to remove data from the pouch database, the pouch specification wants us to check if the data exists first. If it doesn't exist, then there's nothing to delete. If the data does exist, then we will proceed to actually delete it. So we need to first get that item from the database to make sure it exists. So we have to get from the database first. What we're trying to get is pound the, I mean dollar the class. Whatever the person typed after we've made it to uppercase, that's what we're trying to delete from the database. Comma. We've been seeing that whenever we do anything with pouch, then we get a function, an anonymous function callback with either an error or a result. Okay, so we're going to break this into a couple of lines where we will have an if-else statement. That's going to get a little messy here, so at the end of um, those curly braces, I'm going to put dot and dot get. This is to show me that the, this pair of curly braces and parentheses and semicolon all comes back from the end of dot get, because this is going to be kind of big here eventually. So quickly, I'm showing myself here that this is the end of the dot get, just to be safe. db dot get. Remember, it's a comment, so it doesn't matter what you write here, but this might make it easier to understand as you're looking at your hundreds of lines of code later on. That ends the db dot get method. Then we've got an if else check. I could be trying to get a class that doesn't exist give some feedback to that. If it is a class that does exist, then do the, do the following. So we're going to assume we got a, we got a result. We're going to assume we got a, a result, which means that yes, that class exists. So we'll, we'll deal with what happens on if, if in a moment. Let's deal with else, which is we'll give ourselves some console output Oh, and the console output will we'll give the error message to ourselves. What's what's the problem there? And then maybe some user feedback, uh, some sort of alert. Later on, we can make a nicer Cordova alert. But for the moment, we'll say um, error. Not very user friendly yet. Until we can figure out what possible errors we can get, and then make some better user friendlier output. And later with jQuery Mobile, we'll be able to make some nice pop-ups that fade in and all of that nice stuff. But we're going to assume then, from this if-else, we got a positive result, which was that, yes, that class exists. So what will happen inside of if, that's when we actually do the db.remove. DB
if there is a class to remove, let's remove it. If there isn't a class to remove, we give the user an error, and we'll figure it out in the console. What we're trying to remove, then, is result. We're trying to get a class, and if the class exists, it'll give us back an object that includes the data necessary for us to remove the data from the database. So we're going to remove the result and that will be again a function, an anonymous function with error and result. Break that, and I'll give myself a comment there. That's end of db dot remove. This requires an if else statement to deal with this level of possible errors. to be either a result or the else, which is the error. Put that out on the console. Give a basic pop-up to the user for the moment. Let's say error. Usually at this point it's error. Uh, class does not exist. So if we get to the point of that result from remove, there was a class that existed from dot get. So therefore, when we got to the positive result of remove, the, the data has been removed from the database. We should be able to test that at this point. We'll fill in what this if will fully be in just a moment. But if I save it and run it at this point, refresh it. I've got a class 2099, so I'm going to type 2099 and click delete class. I didn't get anything from the console. But if I look under my app, under my index DB, under my pouch, by sequence, the, um, that particular item has been removed from my sequence. If I look in the actual you know, back end of it all in the app by sequence, the fourth object deleted true, 2099. I also refreshed my screen. It is gone. If I do it again, I'm going to delete 2059H, delete class. Nothing happens on screen. I haven't programmed that. If I refresh my database here, there's a listing of that object of 2059 deleted true. There is the one back there that used to exist. The pouch now is saying that's been deleted. So for all intents and purposes, it's gone. But it's sort of like on a regular operating system where if you delete something off of your desktop, it goes to the trash can. If you empty the trash can, it's gone. But not really. You can still use undelete software oftentimes to bring back deleted um, files. 
so deep down on things, there's often a way to bring it back. And here in Pouch, I, you saw that I clicked delete for 2059, and Pouch says it's been deleted. The remnant data is still there, which can be retrieved if you really want to bring it back. Uh, with more effort. But it's been deleted. It's been marked with delete. It did not update here. We haven't set that. If I refresh and show class, it has been deleted. It's just that the table has not redrawn. That's why the table still showed the old class. So that means that in my db.getDB.remove final result positive result, I need to once more show the table, redraw the table, because now there's a new table with something less. So we have function show classes. On if, we need to call function show classes. There's a new set of data in the database. Therefore, show that new set of data on screen. If we're this deep into the remove process, there's a new table to show. Show the new table. Let's try that. I'm going to save it. This, uh, I'm going to refresh it. I'm going to add one more class quickly, just gibberish class. Save class. Show class. Okay, I've got class 32432. Delete class. Delete it. Deleted internally as I showed before, but now it deleted visually for the user because I reran the show classes function, which its job is to show the latest version of the classes on screen. Obviously, if I delete my last class here, 2040A, oops, 2040A right here, delete class, well, the, the whole table gets is empty, um, nothing to show. And as I start to add more classes, save. Well, knowing that, it might be a good idea to add the function show classes to the save button so that that gets repopulated as soon as possible. Pause right there. Anyone need any help? Is everyone able to delete their classes? that worked. We have one aspect of this, yet one more aspect. We've been able to save data to the database, retrieve data from the database, delete data from the database. Next comes edit data in the database because I wanted to actually write English 1, because I've got English 2, English 3. I want to go back and edit data. That's coming up next. But let's write some comments on our code so far. Line 106, define or no to say function to delete an existing class. Let's say next line here, uh, retrieve or store the class CRM. force letters to uppercase uh, first get a class from 
TouchDB. If good result if bad error let the user know something went wrong Remove the class from pouch. Good result. On the top, remove. If good result, then redraw the table with the latest data. So it's a, it's a process. We have the dot get method of pouch. We have then the dot remove method of pouch. There's then checks to see is it working, is it not working. Then we have to deal with those results. Error results often then are some sort of output to the user that something went wrong. We would have to beta test it to try to figure out what things could go wrong. One of them that I already told you ahead of hand uh, is that uh, if a person tries to delete a class with a capital A, but they wrote a lowercase a, well, a safety thing to do there is force it to uppercase. I want to then remember to go back and force all the input to uppercase, because this could cause a failure if they did deliberately want to put a lowercase. Once we've got all those checks in place, then we need to redraw the table so that uh, the latest uh, data shows up on screen. Let's find in our code where we should force to uppercase the original input. Because if we've got over here forcing to uppercase, we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot if we don't have original data as uppercase. So we need to find where do we apply that first. It's going to be somewhere under, let's see, function save class back on line 43 or so is where we first save our class and we are taking in the CRM value and then we're simply putting it into our JSON object to then save into pouch well before we put it into the JSON object let's take a moment to force it to uppercase so that we got uppercase matching to uppercase so before Line fifty um, dot uh, uh, dollar val crn equal to dollar val crn dot to uppercase. So even if the person typed in a lowercase a, if they're trying to save class twenty ninety nine a, and they put it lowercase, we're going to force it to uppercase so that it's stored in the database uppercase. And then now our to uppercase check will always work when we're trying to delete the class. You no. Know, no problem or ambiguity if they try to delete an uppercase or lowercase class. Make a 
note here, force to uppercase a letter Okay, um, let's see, okay, uh, we should have done this before we've done the new stuff, but um, this whole little block right here showing classes, let's take a quick moment to write some comments there, uh, which was the last thing we did last time, we forgot to add comments, so we'll go back up to about line 82, that's where I've got function show classes, function to retrieve the pouch database data. I'll write a comment above all docs instead of to the right. We'll say dot all docs to retrieve all records from database options include docs um, that's all fields ascending true that should be obvious options include all docs all fields not just underscore ID and then ascending alphabetized from A to Z. So our dot um, all docs, that's what that's doing. It's retrieving the data from the database, including our every field of every element that we've input, not just the ID. Alphabetize A through Z. Out of that we get an, we get an error or result. Well, here's our if else, if uh, I'll say in this case, if no error, pass the data into function to make it pretty. If we didn't get an error, okay, we've got data. Let's pass that data into a function that will show it on screen in a nice pretty way. Or else, else there was an error. So that's our show classes function, which then basically passes our data onto function show class table. So here, construct a table based on pouch data. Build a string of HTML, 
using a table. A row in the table with headings. got a for loop for x number of times worth of data I think on this one it might be safer not to put a comment at the end of that line and because you've got the plus if we're building a string it's one command from here to here so I think it's safer not to put a comment at the end here because then we'd be putting a comment within the statement and remember single line comments make a comment to, toward the end so I don't know if, how that'll work so I think it's safer this way I'm gonna put it above the string creation to say um, build a row at a time of data. And the table horizontal rule and dynamically create an input field and a button. To delete classes. The last line of that is uh, render the string as HTML on screen. Right, so if all of that works, let's save that. We'll take our first break. And then after we come back, well, we need to now update data in the table. So we've got, I want to fix that to say English too. We'll set up a way for us to have that pencil be active to click and edit that data. But that's after the break. So it's 7.03. We'll be back at 7.13. If you need any help with any of this, let me know, and we'll continue in 10 minutes.